Good morning. Welcome to Westminster Presbyterian Church. We are glad you are with us this morning. If you are worshiping with us in person and have a prayer request, you can fill out the pink prayer request cards and they'll be collected during the second hymn. And if you're worshiping with us online, the prayer requests can be put in the comments and they will be included in our prayers of the people. You may have seen in our many news and views this week that um, there is a family in need of our help. Uh, they're a family we've been working with, but they've asked not to be named. The, one of the children was hit by a car in the last month, and so there's a lot of recovery that's happening. If you would like to help them, there is a list of things that they've asked for in the many news and views, and you can reach out to me for more information. Um, you can also give to the pastor's fund, and we'll be using that fund to help this family with various um, things that come up for them. So if you are able to give, we would greatly appreciate it. And Blake has our next announcement. When this congregation was founded in 1964, it was done so with the promise that it would be engaged in campus ministry, um, which was true every year of our life up until the times of the pandemic. And now we have an opportunity to re-engage in campus ministry and to do so with a partnership on uh, some of the best real estate in the whole campus, Grace Place Campus Ministry on the corner of Normal and Lucinda. Uh, and uh, Matt Patrick, uh, a pastor at Grace Place Campus Ministry is here today to talk to us about what goes on at that ministry, and you'll see why I think it's a, a great fit. So that will happen today at 1130, and it's not true we'll be stopping cars at the exits to keep you here. Um, it was a close vote. So we hope you hang around and uh, hear what uh, Mac has to say. That's at about 1130. Get coffee, donuts, be in a good mood, come at 11.30. We're also not requiring that you return your pledge cards in order to attend this meeting, but please <laughs> bring your pledge cards back as we are in our stewardship uh, time. And so please return those pledge cards as soon as you can so we can plan for next year's budget. Is there any other announcements? Yes, we do have one. So I'd just like to remind you that uh, after worship, but before the forum, uh, the Mission and Community Outreach Commission will be holding uh, our last Sunday for the offering of letters uh, to support the, the hunger campaign. So uh, if you haven't already done so, we'll have materials available uh, either for you to take home so that you can write letters at home or for you to write letters here, and then we will have envelopes and stamps available. So take advantage of that in the half hour between worship and the forum. Thank you. Are there any other announcements? Let us continue our worship by rising in body or in spirit and join in our call to worship. Blessed is our God who hears our prayers. Whose steadfast love endures forever. God calls us to proclaim the good news. Open our heart.
please be seated. Because we are loved, we turn to God in humility. We fall short of we fall short of who God calls us to be, but we are never forsaken. In faith and with confidence as beloved children of God, let us confess our sins. Almighty God, you have raised Jesus from death and life and crowned him Lord of all. We confess that we have not bowed before him or acknowledged his rule in our lives. We have gone along with the ways of the world and failed to give him glory. Forgive us and raise us from sin that we may be your faithful people, obeying the command of our Lord and Jesus Christ, who rules the world and is the head of the church, his body. And all God's people say. Believe the good news. God loves us and forgives us and sets us free. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. In response to God's forgiveness, we are called to live lives of deeper faith. Hear these words for what God requires of you. Seek justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. Amen.
Now is the time in our service, <clears throat> excuse me, for a special message for the children of God. We are all called God's children, so all are invited at this time. Good morning, good morning. Oh, you came the long way today. Hello. <laughs> and one more. Oh, ooh, you have some fun buses today. That's pretty cool. Well, I want to talk to you about something today. Have you guys ever sent a letter? Have you ever written a letter? Who have you sent letters to? My grandmother. Your grandmother? My Who'd... grandparents. Your grandparents? Is that, is that true, grandparents? <laughs> Friends? Well, I have some letters up here, and they're for a couple of different things. Sometimes people send me Christmas cards. What's on this Christmas card? What is it? It's a puppy. It's a puppy. And the snow on it. You guys want to hold it for me? And this one just says Merry Christmas. And then sometimes people send me cards that say thank you. They're called thank you cards, right? That one is from my teacher because I gave her a gift card. That's so kind. Do you guys write thank you cards when you get gifts? Yeah, sometimes we remember. And then I've also gotten some birthday cards recently because it was my birthday, right? And there are all the, I am 30 years old and someone thought to put that on a card for me. <laughs> Isn't that kind of them? It even says, remember when you were little and somebody told you 30 was old? Isn't that funny? Well, they were right. That's what it says on the inside. <laughs> I know, it's so silly. But sometimes we send letters for serious things too, right? And so before there were TVs and telephones and computers, before we could text and email each other or call each other, we wrote letters. And do you know what some of the books in the Bibles are? They're letters. A lot of these letters are written by someone named Paul. And he would write letters to churches, kind of like ours, and teach them things. And so today we're going to read a letter from Philippians. And he starts his letters like this. From Paul and Timothy, to all of those in Philippi who are God's people, may the grace and peace of God be with you. Isn't that such a lovely way to start a letter? We give people the grace of God before we start a letter, and that's how Paul starts all his letters. How do you start your letters? Yes. I say, dear, uh, and then, uh, I'm it. dear whoever you're giving it to. So, dear guy, guy, right? That's who you write. Or dear mom, right? We write Mother's Day and Father's Day cards too. So, sometimes our letters can get really long, right? Some of Paul's letters really long. Like, look how long some of this is. Paul can write for a really long time. Can you imagine sending this in the mail? How many stamps do you think it would take? A hundred stamps. It might. He writes a lot. But all of these letters tell us that God loves us, right? So when you send a letter next, maybe you send a birthday card or a Christmas card or a thank you card, you can remind people that God loves you in that card. Sound good? Let's say a prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for the letters in this book, in the Holy Bible, from your, your Apostle Paul, for the things that he taught us, and for sharing your love with us. May we share the love of God with one another. Amen. All right, have fun. Thank you for holding on to my cards. We'll what see you guys you next week. <laughs> Let us unite in the prayer for illumination. God most high, reigning in glory, send down your spirit of wisdom to shine in your heavenly word so that we may worship you with joy, continually blessing your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from the first chapter of the book of Philippians. We read from chapter 1, verses 1, to the first part of verse 18. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, 
to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God for every remembrance of you, always in every one of my prayers for all of you, praying with joy for your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work in you will continue to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this away about all of you, because I hold you in my heart, for all of you are my partners in God's grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the tender affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you to determine what really matters so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually resulted in the progress of the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers and sisters, having been made confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, dare to speak the word with greater boldness and without fear. Some proclaim Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. These proclaim Christ out of love, knowing that I have been put here for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but intending to increase my suffering and my imprisonment. What does it matter? Just this, that Christ is proclaimed in every way, whether out of false motives or true, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. Here ends the reading of the text. If you do have a prayer request as we sing our next hymn, we invite you to hold them up so that the ushers can collect them.
Let us pray. Be with us, gracious God, as we come to your word. Help us to understand its importance for our lives. May we use it to shape who we become. And may it strengthen our faith, deepen our faithfulness. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. In the past few weeks, we have been talking about the Apostle Paul, talking about his conversion and talking about one of his imprisonments that come to us from the book of Acts. And today, we turn to one of his works. We know it was written from prison, but we don't know which prison. Um, One of the things that is guaranteed to have happened when you have a pastor is that they will have undergone a criminal records check. And I just think about the Apostle Paul, and uh, I can see that search committee going, I don't know, I don't know. This guy seems to have some trouble with the law. And we know he was in prison at least a couple of different places, including a final imprisonment in Rome, which is a likely sight for him writing this letter to the church at Philippi, but we just can't be sure. And in any event, I don't know that it matters so much. What is remarkable is that, of course, at the time Paul was writing this letter, there was plenty of bad news to go around. Uh, We know that about 20 years after Jesus died, there was a round of persecution that would happen to Jews and Christians in Rome. They couldn't tell them apart at the time. And so they threw them all out of the city. And this persecution was the first of a series of persecutions that would happen to Christians. Uh, it will get worse for Christians along the way. There will be the persecution that comes from Nero in 60, and then full-out persecution in around the year 80. Um, After this, Christians will show up in the Colosseum as uh, recreation, as they are attacked by wild beasts. And... um, We know that back and forth across the Roman Empire, uh, the Christian faith will be persecuted. At one time, nearly all the religious works of the Christian faith will be destroyed by an effort of the Roman Empire. And the fact that we have texts now uh, is testimony to people willing to risk their lives just for that purpose. So, as Paul writes, he is writing in a time that is filled with bad news. I once heard uh, a comedian, Richard Jenny, talk about uh, what happens every night at 10 o'clock. And it used to be more common when there were, and this is going way back, some of you may not know this history, but at one time there were only three channels. And... (laughs) And if you turned on the television at 10 o'clock, you were going to get news. And Richard Jenny suggested we should just call it the bad news. You know, they should be honest, come clean. And so everything that you hear is, is like bad. And if you read the headlines from the last week, there was plenty of bad to go around. Uh, yet another shooting. And if some of you have been tourists in Chicago, you will have recognized the L-stop from where the shooting took place. Um, There's 
all kinds of strife and concern in our country. And if you read the international news, there is this fear that what is regional conflict could turn into global conflict. And all of that, all of that was also true during the time of the Apostle Paul. There were attacks and revolutions in parts of the empire. There were uh, dangers for being seen as someone who stood against all that Rome stood for. And so it was not an easy time, just like now. It's not an easy time. And yet listen to what Paul has to say. I thank my God for every remembrance of you, always in every one of my prayers for all of you, praying with joy for your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. This picture that Paul has of supporting the Philippian church with his love, with thanksgiving, is a reminder of where we always get to start our prayers. We are part of a community of faith. And uh, just like any family, it can drive you crazy sometimes. Uh, somebody pointed out that almost every church has its dysfunctional quality, just like every family. But we always hope that church puts the fun back in dysfunctional. Some of you are still listening. I appreciate that. <laughs> and the reminder that what a great thing it is to be part of an, a community. And like any community, there are tensions and stresses. But maybe we should always start with Thanksgiving. There's uh, a medieval theologian, Meister Eckhart who's gone in and out of favor. He's known as sort of a mystical figure. But he does make a comment that really struck me. If the only prayer you ever say in your life is thank you, that would be sufficient. And Paul starts with the thank you. And maybe today, as we go about our prayers, we should start with a thank you. Thank you for the community. Thank you for a place to share God's word with one another. Thank you for people who care about the same things, who care to make an impact in both their lives and in the world. And that's a big deal. And that's a really good thing to have and to hold on to. Thank you. So we say a prayer of thanksgiving with the Apostle Paul. He'll go on. It is right for me to think this way about all of you because I hold you in my heart for all of you are my partners in God's grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I long for all of you with the tender affection of Christ Jesus. How about that for a way to talk about each other and to think about one another? Um, as many of you are familiar with, uh, this church has been part of the Stephen Ministry Program for a long time. And this is a program that is designed on helping lay folks how, learn how to become good listeners and also to learn how to use some of the spiritual language and the spiritual talk that is part of the New Testament, part of the scripture as a whole. And just to think that somebody will share this kind of gracious language with you, to look at you 
as a child of God, no matter what kind of burdens you are bringing, what kind of things you have to share, and will also be someone who, if you're ready, is ready to share prayer with you. It is such an important ministry. And for those who have been either those who've offered care or those who received it, everybody talks about how useful it is. Um, I probably don't say enough about it up here. Uh, maybe I've grown complacent, but it really can make a difference knowing you've got somebody in prayer for you, knowing that there's somebody ready to listen to you. And that assurance is part of what Paul gives to the Philippians. And I think part of the task of the church is always to give that same kind of assurance. Somebody's glad you're here. Give thanks. Rejoice. And then he mentions a very specific thing that he's praying for the church in Philippi. And it's not that they live easy lives or that they find themselves prosperous. None of that is what he expects for them. But listen what he prays for instead. And this is my prayer that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you to determine what really matters so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. His prayer is that you may grow more full. More full? Yeah, I don't know. His prayer is that you can live a fuller life in your faith. That you can be people that reflect God's love. And that love grows more and more. And that it helps you determine what really matters. What a great prayer. What really matters to each of us? And fundamentally, if we keep knocking away all the noise that comes from the world, that fundamental relationship that we can have with God, that connection, that sense that we have lives that have purpose, and that not only that, we know that our purpose is above all else to reflect that love that has been shown so freely to us. It's a great thing to pray for. It really is. And in that prayer, we sense how the apostle has been transformed by his journey in the faith. By now, he's probably been a Christian a quarter of a century. And he tells all those people at Philippi, a church to which, by all accounts, he has good relationships with, and one of the few letters in the New Testament that isn't designed to solve a particular problem. He's just writing to say, I pray for your spiritual gifts may you be filled with the love of Christ. Um, as I think back over uh, the time in which I was preaching to an empty sanctuary, there are few times when I have felt so supported by the prayers of the church than when I was here uh, talking to nobody because I knew you were out there. And I knew also that, um, that it was your prayer that was holding this place up. And that prayer remains what keeps us going. And the idea that all of you are praying for each other and for us, that means a lot. 
And I think uh, Paul's elevation of both that prayer of thanksgiving and that prayer for the fullness of the gifts of Christ is a great place for us to start as a church community. Um, I really like uh, how the apostle laid out this prayer of thanksgiving and a prayer for spiritual gifts, and it fits really well for points one and two in a sermon. So nice job, Paul, and thanks for making it easy for me to translate that message. Um, now here comes the hard part. Uh, part three in this passage, Paul talks about his imprisonment. Uh, let's hope we don't go there. Uh, but there have been great and faithful people through the years who have found ways uh, to make witness uh, from prison. If you've ever uh, read uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail, uh, you understand what a powerful witness it is to stand up to your faith to the point of being even in prison. And especially when that point was so important to be made to the whole country, to the whole world, that God's love was broader than our artificial divisions and that race should not be a barrier between people. What a message and what an important testimony came from prison not so very long ago. I mean, if this letter was uh, written around 30 years after Jesus' death, around 60 in the common era, uh, here it was still in the 1960s that we were facing that great struggle in imprisoning church leaders. It's a remarkable, remarkable testimony. So to know that there is faithful ministry to be had wherever you are at seems to be the most important lesson that comes from Paul. His circumstances were very limited, uh, he couldn't get out, he couldn't even preach, but even in jail, he managed to convert the guards around him. How about that? Uh, and uh, even in those circumstances, he finds a way to be faithful. Uh, no doubt, many of you are in circumstances that are less than desirable. Maybe some of you are are in a place where you feel trapped by financial concerns or trapped because a burden of care for a family member has fallen upon you. Or maybe you feel trapped because you can't figure out what your future holds. But in all of this, in all of this, there becomes a way to be a witness a way to show some light and a way to offer some hope, even in circumstances that seem overwhelming. Uh, in a couple of places, Paul will uh, show sort of a little vindictive spirit. Uh, it's interesting to read him for that, and it's a reminder that we don't have to be perfect for God to use us in remarkable ways. Uh, well, just read the book of Galatians, and you'll see in there a couple of places where his anger just bubbles over at people that are trying to impose new burdens on the Christians that are recently converted in the Galatian area. Uh, and that same sort of temperament shows up as we get to the end of the passage today. Uh, some proclaim Christ from envy and rivalry, 
hmm, that would be those that maybe he didn't like as well. But others from goodwill, that would be those that he liked. These proclaim Christ out of love, knowing that I have been put here for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but intending to increase my suffering in my imprisonment. Uh, so people he doesn't like are continuing to preach the gospel and this is supposed to inflict grief on him. And you go, are, are you sure about that? And, and as I listen, I, I really have to say, are you sure about that? But he finally reaches a place where we can all land. What does it matter? Just this, that Christ is proclaimed in every way, whether out of false motives or true, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. May we all rejoice in the overflowing love that God shows us in the hope of the gospel. And may we uphold one another, one another with thanksgiving, with prayers of intercession, with a desire that we all share in God's great spiritual gifts. Amen. Let us stand and affirm our faith. This is the good news which we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved, if we hold it fast, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared first to the women, then to Peter, and to the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and our God. Amen. You may be seated. Um, as we come to our prayers today, we do have these requests. A prayer request for Kevin Meyer, who was recently diagnosed with stage 5 colon cancer. Prayers are requested for his healing and for his family. Uh, prayers for Ukrainian soldiers who are now prisoners of war. Uh, prayers are requested for all those affected by the hate crime committed in Buffalo, New York. Prayers also for all who are faced with racial hatred. on a daily basis. And prayers are requested for Dick McLaughlin as he recovers from shoulder replacement surgery. With these concerns in mind, let us come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, it is with thanksgiving that we gather as your people this day we are grateful for your call and claim on our lives, for the purpose you grant to each of us. Open our eyes to the gifts that are here in this community and help us respond with gratitude to those that we find here. In addition to our prayer of thanksgiving, we also Pray for the spiritual gifts of all your people. May those of us gathered here grow closer to Christ and better reflect all the fruits that he promises to give his children. May our love and our joy, our peace and our patience, our goodness, our kindness, our self-control be known by all 
And may those fruits help season a world that is so often filled with hatred. We hold the concerns mentioned this day before you. We pray for Kevin Meyer in his treatment and we pray for his healing. We pray for captured Ukrainian soldiers. We pray for those affected by the hate crime committed in Buffalo, New York. And we pray also for all who are faced with racial hatred on a daily basis. We pray also for Dick McLaughlin as he recovers from shoulder replacement surgery. Hear us, gracious God, as we offer our prayers of concern, our prayers of thanksgiving, our prayers of hope, in the silence of our hearts before you now. And now, as our Savior has taught us, we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now offer our gifts to God.
Let us pray. Dear God, wherever we look, from next door to a world away, we see the places where your creation groans. May these gifts be a faithful response to those cries. Amen. And now go in peace, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with each one of you from this time forth and forevermore. And all God's people say,